Keeping my mill from wearing white? I'm so confused, please help. I'm getting married soon, and we're having a traditional wedding, I'm Indian, my fiancé isn't but he was fine with having an Indian wedding. My mill to be asked me if she could wear white to our wedding, I said sure and now my fiancé is really mad at me. He says she is going to try to steal the spotlight, and she'll definitely show up wearing a long white dress and it was very irresponsible of me to just agree like that. The thing is one, I'm not going to be wearing a white bridal dress, I'll be wearing a traditional red dress that due to the design, lahenga, type of silk and embroidery is very distinctive so even if my mill does wear a white wedding dress it's not like it'll be the same? Question mark also, this may be dumb but I don't really get what the big deal is if my mill wears white even if I was also going to? As long as the groom doesn't get confused and marry the wrong person, how does it matter? Sorry if this is dumb but my fiancé is really upset that I didn't stop my mill, and I just need some help understanding, I didn't mean to upset him. Edit my fiancé knows what my wedding dress looks like, he has seen it. Edit too for those asking if Mill knows how my wedding dress looks, I'm not sure. We have discussed what the wedding will be like, she hasn't been to an Indian wedding before, but I don't think we explicitly discussed what I will be wearing, I feel like she was confused when I said she is free to wear white but that might be me projecting because the whole conversation was a bit confusing for me. Update. So as you all suggested, I talked to my fiancé about why he was concerned. He explained that his mother had previously joked that she would wear white and he had told her point blank that she wasn't allowed to do this. He didn't tell me about this because he didn't want to stress me out, apparently she has a tendency to steal attention throughout his childhood which left some trauma. So basically when I told Mill she could wear white, he was very upset that I had given permission when he had categorically refused, but he admitted it was wrong of him to get that upset when he hadn't shared any of the background information with me. We agreed that going forward we would be better about communicating, and made up. But then he wanted me to call up Mill and tell her she couldn't wear white or else she was banned from the wedding. Which, I didn't really want to do because that sounded like a surefire recipe for open hostility, and like I said earlier I don't actually have a problem with Mill wearing white. I told him that he was welcome to tell her if he wanted, but he was insisting I have to tell her because I was the one who gave permission. It was starting to turn into an argument so I showed him this post and all of your great advice. This really helped D, it helped him realize that even if Mill wore white it wouldn't really stand out, at least not in a positive way, and he loved your guy's idea of just not telling Mill that I wasn't going to be wearing white. So we'll probably offer to buy her a sari but if she insists on wearing a white dress, we just won't stop her. Thank you to everyone who gave advice. I'll try to update after the wedding. Post from op fiancé. Given the way things turned out, it seemed fitting that I post this. I'm the previous poster's then fiancé. After Pia, not her real name, posted, a lot of commenters said I was wrong for not dealing with my mother myself, and I was especially wrong for getting mad at Pia without telling her anything. I didn't want to admit it, but the more comments I read, the harder it was to brush it off. I don't have a good relationship with my mother. She was the type to demand gifts on my birthday because I wouldn't be here without her. For 18 years, I never got to open presents myself. Looking back, every event, from my games to graduation was always about her. I always felt like my life and achievements were just an extension of her accomplishments. I think I suppressed my resentment because everyone around me always acted like this was normal. I didn't know how to cope with this so I just tried to get as far away from her as possible. I applied to furthest university I could realistically get in, and stayed far away because any time I had to go back home, it was the same story. At university I was lucky enough to meet Pia, and for the first time I started to like who I was. I didn't feel like I had to hide or play down my accomplishments, or even my failures. And her family was so warm and welcoming, it felt like my childhood was just a nightmare of the past. I thought the best way to move past it was to just move ahead. I thought I would be able to handle it now as an independent adult. After all, everyone says you're supposed to let sleeping dogs lie. And in my worst moments, I felt jealous of my wonderful fiancé for having such a welcoming loving family, even though they were treating me like one of their own. I was ashamed of my mother's behavior, and the ugliness of my resentment so I pretended everything was fine, and invited my parents to my wedding. Until this post blew up, I don't think I really understood how important my wedding was to me. I mean obviously, the whole getting married to the girl of my dreams is huge, but I mean the actual details of the whole ceremony. I actually had a really clear vision of what I wanted in the wedding, but a combination of my childhood trauma and the notion that wedding is the bride's day and not something men are supposed to care about made me unable to express it. I also didn't understand how badly I wanted an event that would be about me and not my mother. This unholy cocktail of repressed and suppressed feelings led to me unfairly lashing out at Pia when my mother tried her old tricks. At that moment I forgot white wasn't the bridal color in Indian weddings, I just felt a cold sweat that another precious moment would be hijacked by my mother. I think Pia was shocked by my outburst because she had never seen me like this, and made that post just to get some perspective. Neither of us imagined the ramifications it would have. I read every comment at least 10 times. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Unwanted memories kept invading my head, no matter how much I tried to bury my head in work or exhaust myself by exercising. I ended up having an actual meltdown that night. I was sobbing and crying, it was probably my ugliest moment. The next morning I half expected to wake up alone, and get a text that the wedding was off. Instead, incredibly, Pia stayed with me. She convinced me to go to therapy, 
encouraged me through those first few hellish sessions and gave me space when I needed it. Therapy really helped I was able to understand why I was feeling angry and upset, and how to deal with it beyond just trying to ignore it. I apologized to Pia earlier, but it let me actually be honest with her about my family. It really transformed our relationship I took over the wedding preparation, with the help of my in-laws. This turned out to be great for all of us, I got to actually design my dream wedding, my mill later told me she was really relieved that we switched because my lovely Pia didn't really care any which way about the colors or flowers and had virtually no input on any of it as long as we were getting married. You might have realized from her post that she is a pretty nonchalant and easygoing person. She used to joke that she was fine with just exchanging garlands and calling it a day. My mill was also very encouraging and patient in letting me voice my input, and even found things I didn't have but loved, like riding a horse to the ceremony. We have a running joke that I seem more like her son than Pia because our taste is so similar. And the actual wedding went really, really beautifully. Pia was ready to rescind my parents' invitations completely after everything, but her terrifying little sister suggested we invite anyway as a final sort of fuck you, to show them I wasn't alone anymore and no matter what they tried this time things would go my way. I have to admit that did appeal to me, so we decided to invite them for the third day of the ceremony, and it worked even better than I imagined. First, it helped that my mother had no real idea what an Indian wedding is like, so when she showed up in a long white tool ball gown, security actually thought she had the wrong address and didn't let her in. This was actually something I didn't plan, but the schadenfreude of seeing my mother fuming by the gate while other guests were let in was delicious. Secondly, compare the embroidered silks and sleek satins of Indian clothes, my mother's ball gown honestly looked frumpy. Instead of stealing the show, she just looked like she didn't belong. This was accented by the jewelry, the matching churi kungan and earring and bindis worn compared to her much more sparse look. Pia looked especially beautiful in her red langa choli, with intricate henna covering her hands and feet. I'm probably biased since she's my wife, but she has the most beautiful inky hair and it looks stunning adorned with gadra and gold billow on her braid. Indian brides also wear something called a mata patti which looks like a crown, it definitely made her look like a princess. I actually forgot about my parents, and my insecurity, and pretty much the rest of the universe because I couldn't stop staring at her. Then my mother tried really hard to interrupt the ceremony. First she tried coughing, but luckily Pia's aunt sitting next to her gave her a cough drop. Then she tried to initiate a conversation, but Pia's five-year-old niece loudly said in that high-pitched voice of children that really projects don't you know it's rude to talk during weddings? I'm five and I know that. I later learned that she had been coached to respond this way by my wonderful, terrifying Sil. The third time she tried to interrupt Pia's cousin, who had also been coached by Sil, jumped and loudly whispered that the food didn't seem to agree with my mother and needed to go to the bathroom immediately, I'm sure you can guess the implication, and basically pushed her away. After that she stayed embarrassedly quiet for the rest of the ceremony. Throughout all this, the Panditji never missed a beat and everyone else acted like she wasn't there. In the after party, the difference between my mother and everyone else was unpleasantly accented by her ignorance of Bollywood slash Tollywood dance skills, so she tried to refocus attention through conversation. She turned to my mother-in-law and started to complain about how hard it was to raise me. My mill, bless her heart, said however difficult children are, they bring ten times as much happiness just by growing. Your son is such a wonderful young man, you must be so proud of him. My mother didn't like the direction of the conversation, so she turned to Pia and asked her if she was sure she wanted to be with me. This was after we had gotten married. Pia looked at her like she was a bit slow and said why would I be marrying him if I wasn't sure? My mother loudly asked her again if she was really sure, because I used to wet the bed. I haven't done that since I was eight, but there she was, loudly announcing it for all and sundry. At that moment, I really, really hated her. It felt like there was something stuck in my throat, but no words came out. But Pia didn't have that problem. You must be confused, she said, and it was so confident with a touch of concern that my mother looked like she was actually confused. Then she raised her voice so it could be heard over the music. Dear, my mother, I know we are family now, but it's much too soon right now, or ever, for me to hear about your bedroom activities. Then she dragged me away to the dance floor while people started to stare at my mother. Stupidly, the first thing I said in our first dance as a married couple was that my mother was right. But because I am the luckiest man alive, Pia just squeezed my hand and told me it happens when children are put under stress and it wasn't my fault. That was pretty much the end of the problem, and I enjoyed the rest of my wedding dancing, eating food and talking with Pia, and now my, wonderful family. I did see Pia and my Sil having another talk with my mother later, but I was too far away to hear anything. It couldn't have been too bad because my Sil smiled a lot, and my mother didn't try anything new for the rest of the party. By the end of the day, my mother looked incredibly constipated, but she hadn't managed to ruin anything. I felt so relieved when I said goodbye, like a weight had just slipped off my feet and my knees felt weak. It was the first time in my life that she hadn't taken over something that was supposed to be about me. After that day I haven't had any more sudden invasive memories of the past. I feel so incredibly lucky to have married this girl, and I feel like I might have done something really stupid after that fight, if I hadn't seen so many strangers telling me the same thing until I couldn't ignore it, so in case anyone was still following this, I wanted to post a thank you. Parents opened up several credit cards in my name while I was away at college, I guess this is a lesson in paying attention to my finances.
After having just finished my freshman year of college, I came back to my parents' house for the summer. My mom made it a habit on Monday slash Tuesday to make sure she got the mail before I had a chance, even running from the kitchen Tuesday to make sure I didn't get it as I was expecting an Amazon order. Today, the mail came kind of early and there was a letter from a collection agency addressed to me. I only knew it was a collection agency once I opened it and discovered I supposedly owed nearly $5,000 on a Capital One card I had no idea I was ever signed up for. Once I got done freaking out, I called my dad at work and asked him what to do. It was weird when he said to talk to my mother about it. He didn't seem happy at all but I didn't think much of it. Once my mom got home, I asked her about it and she said her and my dad opened up a few credit cards in my name for household expenses. She said she thinks I owe around $10,000 to three different credit card companies. I checked my credit and it turns out I owe over $15,000. We ended up having a huge argument about it with my mom saying her parents did this to her when she was 18. She said that I could file for bankruptcy and that it wouldn't hurt me because I wouldn't be trying to buy a house for several years. I'm interested in going into a government-related job and a bankruptcy would probably disqualify me for it. She knows this but it doesn't seem like she cares. My dad got home a couple of hours ago and they talked to me together. Either I can declare bankruptcy once they spend up to the credit limit of the last card with any credit on it, or they said I could move out at the end of the month. It just feels like it's incredibly unfair because it doesn't sound like bankruptcy will actually do anything for my credit and probably sink my job opportunities. How can I get my credit score back to where it was, which was around 720, and how can I get this to not affect my credit going forward? Update I ended up taking the advice of the vast majority of people here and I filed a police report. The officer took some printouts of everything as evidence. Once I had the report, I called all of the places listed on my report and gave them the report number. The three credit card companies all took it and were pretty cool with it. The collection agency wanted me to make a goodwill payment so they could start investigating my claim that it was fraudulent. They said they could still sue me even with a police report if I didn't cooperate with their fraud report. I refused obviously as I don't want them to be able to take money out of my bank account. I never told my parents that I went to the police and for a couple of weeks, they had no idea. Right after Memorial Day they received a call from a detective and everything blew up. After the call, they began screaming at me and my dad started literally throwing my things out of the door. I called the police at that time and they showed up and told my parents if they wanted me to leave, they would have to evict me. I came home from work the next day and the locks were changed. I called the police again and my parents refused to open the door and said all of my stuff was at my grandparents' house. I received another report number for the unlawful eviction, which I was told was a civil issue, and got my stuff from my grandparents. Luckily, I have a friend with a couple of spare bedrooms and she said I'm welcome to stay with her for a couple of months. I'm scheduled to move into my own place in about a week. Once I get a full tally of the total cost of everything included in moving, I'll be filing a civil lawsuit against my parents for the unlawful eviction. I was told by the same detective my parents didn't seem very truthful with anything and the state's attorney's office will be in contact in the next few weeks regarding identity theft charges. He said he believes they will likely prosecute, possibly as soon as this week. If that's the case, they, or more likely just my mom, will be issued a warrant and have to spend at least a night in jail. No matter what, I feel as though I made the right choice. Ida for not letting my kids ride four hours home with their grandmother? Around 1 a.m. there was a terrible crash as my, 70F, Mill decided to try to navigate our stairs in the dark while wearing a CPAP. She tumbled down the steps, hitting her head bad enough to bruise her face and cause some serious swelling around her ear. I immediately started calling 911 but my wife who is a NICU RN told me not to call as her mother had no obviously broken bones and didn't want to go. I'm not a medical professional and it's seldom wise to argue with a nurse or one's wife but I pressed for them to at least let me drive her to the ER if they refused an ambulance but all to no avail. This was just a couple of hours ago and she's now in the bed with an ice pack and a couple of Tylenol, to avoid blood thinners. In the morning she wants to drive home and take my, 9F, daughter and, 13 meters, son to her place for the week. This has been planned for weeks and I would have no issues with it but for the fact that the woman just fell down a flight of stairs and could have a concussion. I love her and don't want her to drive at all and asked her to stay a couple of extra days but if she insists on going I can't stop her. I told my wife I was uncomfortable with the kids riding with her given the danger and she thinks I'm being silly which I don't understand at all as she's a very competent nurse. I finally told her that everyone could be mad at me but it simply wasn't an option. I'll take the day off and drive them if I must but I won't take any chances. Ida? Update 18 hours later. Well, my mill was alive and conscious when we woke this morning. My wife stayed up to watch over her through the night. I spoke to my wife this morning and again shared my concerns regarding the dangers my mill would be posing to herself and our kids and my wife was frustrated that I questioned her opinion but when I asked if she was so utterly certain in her diagnosis sans any medical equipment that she was willing to bet both her mother and our children's lives on it, she sheepishly relented and agreed the kids would stay home and that she would encourage her mom to go to the ER. I spoke to my mill again and asked her to let me take her to the ER, and she shared that her primary reason for refusing medical care was a fear of the cost of doing so. Unfortunately, that's a serious concern of many folks here in the US. Anyways, hearing that, I firmly insisted she go and told her we'd cover any costs. She and my wife finally went to the ER and after several hours and copious tests, 
It was in fact determined that she had a concussion as well as rib and wrist fractures and soft tissue injuries, bruising. My wife was pretty devastated with the diagnosis and was deeply apologetic and remorseful. My mother-in-law will be in the hospital until at least tomorrow. The hospitalist pretty directly chided both my wife and Mill. All in all, I'm thankful that things didn't end up worse. The kids only cared about their grandma being okay. Some answers to questions asked. My Mill is a retired school teacher on a very limited fixed income along with my Phil. There's no inheritance or other reason my wife would have wished her ill. They have a great relationship. My wife sprang out of bed the moment the accident happened and was almost detached and clinical at the moment but was later extremely emotional. Her father had a major stroke last year, and we actually just sold our house Friday in order to move closer to her parents to help take care of them in their old age. While my wife has been a NICU nurse for a decade, she was a step-down ICU nurse for eight years. I realize that doesn't strengthen her case regarding her decision, but perhaps it adds context. She really is remarkable with babies and has saved many a life, but I can certainly understand why the circumstances of these events would paint her in a less than beneficial light. In retrospect, I think my wife was in a state of shock. She's never lost anyone, and her dad's stroke is still fresh on her mind. I've lost both parents and four siblings plus plenty of friends my time in the service, so I have to look at her through a lens of empathy. I, 24F, told the man I have been taking to, 30M, that I am nervous to meet him because I'm overweight. I, 24F, have been talking with a man well call him Tom 30M for about a month. We have not met yet in person and are supposed to finally meet in the beginning of June. An hour ago, I sent him a message telling him that I am nervous to meet him because I am a bit overweight. For context, about one. Five years ago I ended things with my ex fiance The breakup was very messy and mentally taxing. I entered a depressive state. I stopped working out, gained about 60 pounds, I was vaping and dependent on alcohol much more than I should have. I also didn't feel like myself at all and was very unhappy. Luckily, I have an amazing family, friends and a pretty dope therapist. Slowly, I've been able to pull myself out of my depression rut and by the start of this year I was feeling much like my old self again. Feeling better, I decided to really grind down on breaking these bad habits. I quit vaping 3 months ago and about 1 month ago I started going to the gym consistently. My relationship with alcohol is much healthier as well. Now I'm trying to clean up my diet to lose weight so I can feel confident in my skin again. I really had no intentions of dating seriously until I met my goals but here we are. At the begging of this month I was bored and swiping on Hinge and I happened to match with Tom. He asked to follow me on Instagram and I didn't think much would happen. The first few days we chatted it was sparse and nothing of interest. Plus he told me he would be out of town in another country until June. Then everything shifted, we had one really good conversation and I found myself looking forward to each notification I received from him. He's sweet, kind and really funny. He remembers small details such as my favorite flowers. Today he even sent me a photo of a plate with my favorite flower and said it reminded him of me. He's also told me he already likes me on numerous occasions. We send photos of each other back and forth. He has seen what I look like, but I don't think he realizes I'm a bit chubby. Mainly in the arm and stomach area. We are supposed to meet when he comes back and I started to get nervous that he would no longer be attracted to me. Which is something that has never bothered me before, I have still been casual with men throughout this. I also know that I am pretty and so much more than looks but, I have genuine feelings for this man and I am afraid of his rejection. I sent him a message a few hours ago with many of the same details I included here. I'm really nervous for his response and it's getting close to morning in the country he's currently at. I want to hear advice from those who may have been in a similar situation. Update. Hi guys, I do have an update for everyone. I wanted to start by thanking everyone for the very kind comments and encouraging messages. I really appreciate everyone who took the time to read this post and give thoughtful advice. I also wanted to address all of the photos on my Hinge profile and Instagram are from the past 8 months. None of my old photos from when I was thinner are present on either platform. However, I do feel these photos are more flattering angels of myself. Now on to the update. An hour after my Antichula post he did see and reply to my message. I got super nervous and took some time to calm my nerves before opening and replying. To my absolute delight it was very thoughtful and kind message. Up. You were considering waiting and making excuses not to meet? You're beyond fine. I appreciate the vulnerability, but you didn't need to say all of this. However, since you did I'll say this back. Wherever you're at is fine. You're beautiful, and there's no need to worry. I'm not worried one way or another. Lifestyle, chemistry, and compatibility are what's important to me when looking at who I'm interested in seeing not if there's some arbitrary societal standard of weight or beauty. If there's anything I can do to ease that worry, let me know. We ended up talking until about 4 in the morning and I'm happy to say that we will be meeting when he is back in the beginning of June. Thank you so much again. I will maybe give another update in the future here soon. Update. I know everyone has been waiting for the update and I'm happy to say today we finally went on our date. Thank you again for all of the encouraging comments and support. But, before I jump into that there were a few more comments and questions I wanted to address, especially because this post made its way to other subreddits. First thing is that both Tom and I are from the US and live in the same state. He was out of the country for work. He is not foreign. Second, many people assumed that I was sleeping with other men while talking to him. I was not, in fact he was the only person I was talking to. 
Now onto the date itself. It was absolutely wonderful and he is genuinely one of the kindest, funniest and most handsome man I have ever had the pleasure of going on a date with. Tom was very excited to see me, we hugged and he surprised me with sunflowers. We got cozy on the couch and ended up talking for nearly 4 hours. We got kicked out because the spot we went to closed. He was really easy to talk to and the conversations moved just as smoothly as they did through texts. Also, I kept blushing because he kept complimenting me and the way he was looking at me I know he is attracted to me. After we got kicked out, we chatted outside for a bit longer and he walked me to my car. We hugged and I went to kiss him on the cheek and he turned my face and kissed me on the lips instead. It was very cute and sweet. Tom asked me if I wanted to see him again this weekend and I said yes. He also messaged me immediately when he got home of when and where we will be going. Ida for refusing to cook dinner for my BF since he won't respect my cooking utensils? I, 21F, live with my BF, 28M, and I recently purchased some new wooden spoons, like the big kind, from a co-worker who is an aggressive pampered chef consultant. I don't make very much money and frankly these spoons were overpriced but I wanted her to leave me alone and after all they're nice spoons and I will definitely use them. They are hand wash only, which I informed my BF of when I brought them home. It's been a couple months and I find them in the dishwasher pretty regularly. Every time I have nicely reminded him that they are hand wash only and please don't put them in the dishwasher. I have said, you don't need to wash them, leave them out and I will wash them. Every time he says okay but then, you know where this is going. I often come home on my lunch break to keep up with housework. A few days ago I came home and found one of my wooden spoons in the dishwasher. I texted my BF about it, this time with some emphasis on the fact that I've repeatedly asked him not to put this item in the dishwasher and it will literally end up destroying the spoon and I really don't want that to happen to a new utensil I just bought. He replied I don't care. I was completely taken aback. I expected him to say okay sorry and probably keep doing it, not be completely rude to me. Background, I have always cooked dinner since we moved in together two years ago, I was in school and it felt like part of how I contributed to the household since I wasn't making very much money only working part time. But I'm out of school now and working more and contributing more to the bill so I don't feel the same obligation to cook. He usually cleans up after dinner by putting things in the dishwasher, but doesn't clean anything else. When he got home after work that night, he asked what we were having for dinner. I told him I'd already eaten. He was extremely upset that I hadn't cooked for him or otherwise arranged dinner. He stomped around the house and eventually got takeout. The next day he asked me what we were having for dinner. I told him I wasn't planning on making anything. He asked why I wasn't cooking anymore and I said if he didn't care about whether or not my wooden spoons got destroyed then I didn't care about cooking dinner. He totally lost it, said I was completely overreacting, it was no reason to stop cooking dinner without warning. Told me I'm being immature and that he's too busy to keep track of what can or can't go in the dishwasher and it's unfair that I'd punish him for it. It's not his fault he doesn't care about wooden spoons, and insinuated our relationship might be in trouble if this is how I react to conflict. I do feel like maybe this wasn't the most mature route and I am a lot younger than him so I'm worried he's right that I'm being unreasonable and immature. But like, how hard is it to leave my wooden spoons out for me to wash after being told multiple times that they can't go in the dishwasher? Edit so this totally blew up and I'm pretty overwhelmed by the response. It's clear to me that most of you are right that the incident is a red flag and highly telling about the dynamics of our relationship overall. I have always thought that I'm happy in this relationship and that it's really good, but now I'm really confused and have a lot to think about. To answer common questions. We met when I was 17 and he was 24. He does do some chores. Well, he takes out the garbage sometimes, mows the lawn sometimes, though I confess that I also do that one on my lunch break occasionally, and handles all the car maintenance. But he's never done any real cleaning in the house. The house is his, he bought it when I was 19 and I do currently pay for half the mortgage slash bills slash groceries. It leaves me essentially no money for myself. Our finances are pretty mixed and he monitors my credit card usage obsessively, to the point that he will sometimes call me 15 minutes after a purchase to ask for details about it. Why did you spend $54? 28 at Costco? Dot, which I see now is also pretty controlling and unhealthy. I am seriously reconsidering the relationship but also don't really know how I'd leave. I've never lived on my own, I don't want to move back in with my parents BC that's a whole other story. I don't know the first thing about getting an apartment on my own, but I don't want this dynamic to be the rest of my life. Thanks for the eye-opening revelation but FCK. Where do I go from here? Second edit forgot to mention he makes about twice as much money as I do. Third edit holy crap you guys. You are all being so amazing to me it's really overwhelming and emotional. I'm hardly responding to comments slash messages BC I'm grappling with a lot of hard truths about all this right now. I am so appreciative for everyone who has taken the time to point out the red flags and offer encouragement and support. This community is freaking amazing and I'm just blown away. I'm also figuring out an exit strategy. I actually already have a small cash stash where I've been saving up money to take the licensing exam for the profession my degree is aimed at. I realize now how sad it is that I've had to sneak cash into an envelope for an exam to a